In your 20s, you took a course at the Edinburgh Acting School one evening a week and you left with a grade 7 in drama, which was quite an achievement. Well, that, the drama school uh, led on, on to other things, you know, getting to choirs and stuff. You actually began performing in your local pub That's called right, the, the Happy, Happy Valley. <laughs> Tell me about the Happy Valley. Oh, this place was a training ground. Walked in on a Thursday night. I used to sneak out on a Thursday night, you see, and go to the sing song. And there was a man there who used to uh, compare the, the, the shows and he got everybody up to sing. It was a kind of hmm. night out sort of thing, you know. And I got up to sing and I was as nervous as anything. Mike was going another one. <laughs> I can't do this, you know. And you're on your own. There's nobody with you. I know, that's what I used to see what this woman doing and hearing her own. <laughs> you know? What, what were you doing then, you're right? Well, I was, I was uh, getting out and about and meeting people. Because I forced myself into doing that. Because if I stayed at home, I would just <laughs> get into a shell and I just wouldn't be able to do anything. Well, it's an amazing thing. Well, there you are, you're incredibly shy, you're a bit of a loner, and you've had this very difficult upbringing, and yet you get up on stage and sing to a bunch of complete strangers. That was a kind of way of escaping. A way of making myself in this kind of persona to be used later. And what was that persona? Well, the Susan Boyle and the, and the, the, the sing songs and in the, the competitions and everything was in a bubble. She was in an area where nobody could touch her, where nobody could bully her. Where they left you alone, where you got the attention you needed and they listened to you. And that's what I was after. You were getting pretty good at singing in front of an audience, but you were about to discover just how good you really were. In her early 20s, Susan began singing in local competitions. She would go um, in clubs and sing. And she always came in second, so she never won. In 1994, when Michael Barrymore's talent show My Kind of People came to Glasgow, Susan had her first shot at fame, but it turned out to be a humiliating experience. He made a complete fool of Susan. And my mother says to her, this is what happens when you go on these shows. But Susan was still keen to prove she had talent. In 2007, she made the journey to an X Factor audition but bottled it at the last moment. When she seen the cues and uh, the age group and the people that were there, I think she gave it a wide berth. Two years later, Susan plucked up the courage to have a go at Britain's Got Talent. Susan didn't tell me she was going for Britain's Got Talent uh, because I, I, think she, I think she suspected that the family would say, oh, another edition, here we go. We also knew that it was in Glasgow. She's not... Well, she doesn't know Glasgow. Well, she got a bus from Blackburn to Bathgate, then from Bathgate to Hartall, then from Hartall to Glasgow. Then she jumped in another bus and it was the wrong bus. It was about six buses later and she was there six hours too early. Susan wasn't your typical glammed up contestant. She wore the clothes in which she'd traveled across Scotland. When she walked on stage, I gave a shudder because I thought, good God, you look as if you got dressed in the dark and Ken Dodd had done your hair. <laughs> you know, but uh, <laughs> brothers are allowed to say that. The audience had already dismissed that woman before she'd opened her mouth. Hi, what's your name, darling? My name is Susan Boyle. And how old are you, Susan? I am 47. <laughs> and that's just one side of me. We try never to prejudge. But because she came out and she was so funny, I thought, oh, she's... Because I thought she was going to be a comic and then she said she was going to sing I Dreamed a Dream, I thought, it's going to be terrible. I can remember quite clearly getting quite grumpy, seeing this lady walk out on stage, and I remember thinking to myself, I hope she's not going to sing. And then she sang. I dreamed a dream in time gone by When she sang, it's the first time I've ever experienced an audience told itself off. And all I could remember thinking was, I hope you know what's coming, because your life's just about to change forever. When dreams are made and used and wasted. I think we 
felt the audience would like Susan, but I don't think anybody could have possibly seen what was coming. My dream. Yeah, I know. It's all your fault. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Why did you choose to sing I Dreamed a Dream? I Dreamed a Dream was about a character in The Miz who was going through a bit of a hard time. It related to the position I was in at that moment. I'd just lost my mum. I'd hardly any money coming into the house. I was lonely. And I wanted to change my situation. And it seemed the appropriate song at the time. When you walked out, Susan, what was going through your mind? Well, um, you can either be serious or damn cheeky. So I thought, well, I failed every other audition. I'm going to enjoy myself. So I, so, I actually thought I'd be cheeky. And uh, I did the audition because I liked a certain gentleman. Who would the... <laughs> Would that be the good-looking Simon Cowell, or would it be a bit closer to home, Susan? Who do you think I'm staying there? <laughs> so you come to see me, basically, hadn't you? Mm-hmm, I see he's right. I've read a lot about this guy, read his books and everything. I've admired him for a while. I wonder if I should just be cheeky or just super sexy. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was being super sexy, so I just gave him a wiggle. <laughs> I like the wiggle. <laughs> You'd been turned down for auditions before. This was you? audition number 12. What I'm intrigued by right now is what was driving you back after so much rejection? Why did you keep going back? It was a bit like being turned down, but that was not anger, but just sheer determination. No, you won't get rid of me that easily. And this is what I want to do. I need to prove a point. What was the point you were trying to prove? The point that I am good at something. I am good at something I will be listened to. I will not be put down by anyone. And those doctors were wrong about me. So the doctors, the bullies, everyone that had tried to put you in that box, you were talking to all of them by turning up these auditions going, I am going to prove you wrong. Exactly. That's exactly it. Because if you get something said to you often enough, you, can, you begin to believe it and you don't do anything. So I just said, right, they are not getting away with this. I am going to show them what I can do. Does it feel good to approve them? Right? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Thank you. Where were you when that show got aired? I was at home and I wanted to watch the show on my own. But my brother John says, you're not watching it on your own. In case anybody comes to your door. How many people knew you'd done this audition? In Very the few, area? because I didn't, I didn't say too much about it, because I wanted to keep it quiet in case it, it went legs up, you know? When <laughs> that clip began to play out, what were you and John thinking then? What was he thinking as your brother, who'd been so protective of you that... Oh, my God, what stupid bugger you've been. Really? <laughs> Look at you. You don't do that in television. But didn't he, didn't he see it turn? Didn't he begin to realise...? He actually said... Susan, I am proud of you. But don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to bed that night, sort of not really realising what was going on? Or? I knew there'd be some attention because I'd been on a, a well-known TV programme. Hmm. I see the scale. I'd never imagined it, honestly. I really well, didn't imagine that. When you woke up and you looked outside your front door and there was complete chaos, what what? what I couldn't go outside the front door for a start. I mean, they actually jammed the streets at one time. There was so much media around. This van appeared at the door with the satellite dish. I goes, uh oh, I haven't paid my TV licence. <laughs> <laughs> so, Susan, you were an overnight sensation and had the whole world at your feet, but the fairy tale was about to take an unexpected twist. From episode one of Britain's Got Talent right up to the final, Susan was the clear favourite to win. The whole world wanted her. Everybody wanted to know what clothes she wore, what she did, who she was, where she lived. Not only was she the centre of attention, but so were her family, so was her home. She'd got people living on her lawn. Blackburn suddenly became the most visited tourist place in Scotland for a tiny moment. The media were snapping at her heels 24-7, and cracks in her behaviour began to show. 
We knew we were being told that, that she wasn't doing very well and she wasn't sleeping, and she doesn't sleep a lot anyway, but when she gets stressed out, you know, it tends to go on for a lot longer. Reports of foul mouth outbursts at a London hotel intensified the spotlight. She doesn't go out, especially to be shouting at people and being in a temper, but she'll take so much and then but everybody else, you just get fed up, don't you? It did get a bit too much and, you know, the, she just felt, you know, I can't really handle this. During the live show, Susan was holed up in a secret London location for days. Even popping to the shop for a newspaper became a media event. Cars crashing, trying to see her, buses tooting horns, people screaming, there's Susan Boyle, she's marching along this road, got her paper. I realised we'll never get from here back to the house. So there was a church, so I rang the bell and this lady came and I says, in the intercom, excuse me, you couldn't let us into the church. I says, I've got Susan Boyle and I'm having some difficulty. I said, Susan Boyle? I just thought, OK, yeah, she's having me on, OK. And then the lady came and she went, oh, Susan Boyle. She came in and we all sat here. We had a cup of tea and I gave her a ginger biscuit. She said, you know what, this is my favourite biscuit. She sent Danny Boy. It was so nice that, you know, this person singing on the stage to so many people is right here. And we could hear the voice, this is the real McCoy, we get in here. It was priceless, priceless. <laughs>